year of course is from the Leadership Foundation. It's been running eight years now. And I think it is true to say that certainly in the UK, it's the main place where tomorrow's leaders in HE are being trained and developed. Um, and he's going to talk both about strategic leadership in general and also the key thing that interests us about technology in the wider sense. Certainly, if you ever want to come to Australia, we need you too. So over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve, for inviting me to talk. And um, yes, I really want to cover two things. One is particularly about the strategic leadership of technology, but the other, more widely, is about stimulating innovation in a time of great change. And I think, if I'm provocative, I think we're brilliant at innovation in terms of the intellectual role of universities, and we're still pretty poor at innovation in terms of how we run them and technology can be a key bridge to that. I was interested in uh, Joe's reference to buy-in, and it, was e it is easy in a small institution, but multiply that by 10 or 20 times or whatever, and you're suddenly into much bigger issues of, of buy-in. So that's what I want to talk about. Yes, we, as the Leadership Foundation, we um, serve the 160 universities of the UK and work internationally as well. And basically, we... We train and develop people at all levels of leadership, not just senior leadership. And this issue I'm talking about is not just about those at the top. It's about how to create a culture of innovation. Um, the, uh, uh, I think ALT Alt actually pinched this from me because your title of your conference was was produced just after I'd actually developed this with David Eastwood, which was Leadership in a Cold Climate, leading when the past is no guide to the future. And I think that's absolutely fundamental point here, that certainly in the UK and maybe many other parts of the world, we've actually, in terms of, you know, although you might say my business in the Leadership Foundation is about learning, we've actually got to encourage unlearning of how we've done things. It's very interesting, and I'm now going to forget who wrote it, but I can tell you afterwards, uh, not published not long ago by Harvard, about disruptive innovation in universities. Um, I can give you the, the details later. Some of you may know it. It's only recently, I think, been published. And that's what we probably need. Um, we, uh, as, a, as, as a leadership foundation, did quite a lot of we did a lot of research into leadership and management in, 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 in universities. And what we came up with was a quite simple concept, which is called the Agile University. And we felt that a lot of universities were rather inagile. Some may think this is a positive, uh, because, you know, in the UK, we've been doing it for 800 years. Why should we change? But there is actually a need to look at agility in universities without throwing out the whole concept of what a university is. And we came up with three things. And those three things were, first of all, new business models for universities. And certainly in the UK, and particularly in England, a whole process of government, p politician change, white paper change is driving us to different business models. Secondly, creativity and innovation. And I want to come on to that in a, in a moment. And thirdly, we felt what was critical was a more strategic approach to technology. Um, and to that end, uh, working with JISC, and I'm pleased to see Malcolm bring it up there, uh, we actually worked together with uh, Joint Information Systems Committee, JISC, uh, uh, two or three years ago now, um, to do a study on all about integration of technology and strategic use of technology. And really what came out of this was rather disappointing. Uh, the report concluded that managers who combine a deep understanding of technology with senior management experience remain uncommon in the sector. And that, I think, and if we go on to um, another quote from the report, which we did with JISC, um, you know, technology can operate at three levels. It can operate at a a transformational level, it can operate as a strategic enabler and as an operational enabler. And the evidence was that it was largely as a, an operational enabler 
And the, um, the third conclusion was that there are significant shortcomings in the capability of senior management teams to identify and exploit the full strategic potential of technology. Malcolm may disagree, but I think if we did that survey today, the results would not be very different. Uh, they'd be just the same. Um, and so what we then did, and um, it's literally being launched this month, and all the details will come up, is we got together with JISC to work through this whole issue, the importance of ICT to strategic leadership. Um, we built a, a model, all this is within the toolkit, you can, there'll be a, a, a reference moment where, where you can um, get details of it. Um, a model was built, and particularly important in that model are issues around strategic leadership, ICT governance, and communications and engagement, critical issues in leadership. And working through that process, we developed working with Nottingham University a strategic ICT toolkit, which in a sense is an opportunity for any university management team, leadership team, to look at itself in the mirror about its use of technology. And that is where, um, I, I don't know, Jilly, whether people have copies of all, or they have access to all of these slides, don't they? So that is, it's actually in transition from being a talk that's being developed and worked on to one which is, will be hosted. And I think it, we, we may well now be in a situation where just Infinet is hosting it, but it is available there. So my first and main point is that if we are to be moving, and many institutions I think will need to, perhaps in a more step change way in terms of the transformation of the institution technology and a more strategic use of technology has to play a key part. I said I would move on for the second part to broader issues of innovation in universities. I've got a very depressing quote from our minister, our Secretary of State, Vince Cable, speaking at our funding council, Hefke Funding Council conference in April of this year. And it's worth just reflecting what the politicians' view was at the time. I expect to see in the university sector faced with the onset of more competition and more demanding students, a ferment of creative thinking on how to redesign core structures and manage major change among staff so as to promote higher quality but lower cost teaching. I may be missing something, he said, but I haven't seen much evidence of this. And I think a real challenge for us in the sector is because it's not right. I, that was actually, I don't think, a particularly good analysis. And we know in our own institutions that a lot of ferment is taking place just because we're being driven by huge changes. But the view from outside, in a sense, is that the ferment isn't there. And I think we have to think about different styles of leadership. On the left-hand side is a traditional hierarchical leader, uh, higher education institution with the sort of focus on senior leadership at the top in a hierarchy. I came eight years ago from, an, uh, from not from within higher education. I was surprised how hierarchical in the UK the leadership of universities is. Very traditional leadership. And I think, and I'm seeing evidence of it, that we have to move to a new kind of model, which is the picture on the right-hand side, in the sense of if the dotted line is what is encompassing the institution, and it's a dotted line because it is porous, it, um, things can move both ways. The L being leadership, that role of leadership, in my view, is a more multi-directional one. And that is a phrase used in an essay that was produced by, we work quite closely with the American Council for Education, and they did a transatlantic dialogue a, a few months ago between European, in fact, Canadian and um, um, American uh, leaders in higher education, looking at the kind of leadership model that was necessary. And they came up with something which they called multidirectional, i.e. your leader is not at the top. Your leader actually, in a sense, is 
going around the perimeter all the time, engaging externally with stakeholders, obviously internally with the institution itself, but actually working more in an interpretative role, a sense-making role, rather than a traditional hierarchical role. And in fact, we're about to publish, we've done quite a lot of research, Leadership Foundation, you can find it on our website. And one of the most interesting bits of research, I think, which we're about to publish is on academic leadership in the new context. And it's done by Professor Jonathan Gosling, who runs the Leadership Centre at Exeter University. And he comes up with this concept of leadership by dialogue. And in other words, we're not about to managerialize universities because the world is sending us into a more commercially driven environment. But we are in that different environment and we have to adapt approaches to leadership that work for it. And in fact, another piece of research that you will find on our website, which is one of the most popular bits we've done a few years ago um, by Dr. Celia Whitchurch of the Institute of Education, and that looks at the relationship between academic and professional leaders in higher education. And she creates, finds significant encouraging evidence of the growth of the positive relationship between academic and professional leaders and the role in creating, they create a sort of third space between academic and professional, and that can be an extremely creative space, debunking the traditional view that the administrators were just well there to, uh, to get in the way. Um, I actually, uh, not long ago, banned my own team, my own staff, for using a word about, that's so often used in this sector, about people who aren't academic, or who are professional staff. Professional staff are often called, or support staff, non-academics. And my view is no one should be defined by what they can't, what they don't do. And that may be people involved in technology, maybe people involved in administration, HR, finance. They're not non-academics, they are professionals. And in terms of innovation in institutions and creating a climate where there will be buy-in, opening up these relationships is, uh, 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 I think, really important. The other thing um, what, which is important is about how entrepreneurial we are as institutions. There are some superbly entrepreneurial institutions. There are equally institutions who somehow don't quite create that sense of excitement about change. And interestingly, I was prompted to use this very old quote from Rosabeth Moss Cantor, um, one of the sort of gurus of leadership. Actually, I heard her speak a year or so in, in London, and she was just as inspirational as ever. And there's that thing about entrepreneurs in her book, her famous book, Change Masters, um, how entrepreneurs always operate at the edge of their competence, focusing more of their resources and attention on what they do not yet know than on controlling what they already know. They measure themselves not by the standards of the past, but by the visions of the future. And they don't allow the past, remember that quote earlier about leadership in a cold climate, they don't allow the past to serve as a restraint on the future. Ask yourself personally where you are on that spectrum. Are you someone who knows that that's the way to operate? Ask yourself also whether your senior top leaders in your institution, where they are on that spectrum. And the other thing that we've done a lot of work of in, on, in the Leadership Foundation is collaborative leadership. It's not, again, something that is easily done. Actually, all of us know, I think, if we're in any kind of management position, the more kind of control we have over something, the easier it is. And once we've got to have partners and collaboration, it just becomes more difficult. But the truth is, in the 21st century, second decade, collaborative leadership is utterly important. Indeed, going back to what I was talking about on strategic use of technology, it is about getting a collaborative approach across the institution to the use of technology and the strategic application of it that matters. 
But this, um, which is from a lovely book, which is very short, um, written by two people who really understand the uh, university system in the UK. One of them, Sir Graham Davis, was the Vice Chancellor of London University. It's called Herding Cats. We've all, some of you may have seen the film Herding Cats. It, yes, you have. It's about two minutes long. It, it literally herding cats across the prairie. Um, and this is quote, and it's just so true. And these are all quotes from people in the sector in the UK. It's really hard to get people to understand why collaboration is so important. I think this is what they can acknowledge this intellectually, but every fibre in their body and their experience and their history is pointing diametrically in the other direction. And this other point, we do find a lot of silos in higher education. We continuously underestimate the tendency and ability of individuals and groups to silo themselves in our sector. And I think these are absolutely cr crucial issues. I mean, you could disagree with this. You could say, I don't need to go this way in my institution. But the experience we have from eight intensive years of working with growing leaders within higher education doing quite a lot of research is collaborative leadership, partnership leadership is absolutely crucial. Um, I'm going to skip really uh, mo most of the last little bit. It's, it's not absolutely fundamental, but just look at the headlines. Um, and that is, you know, most countries, certainly in, in, in the Western world at the moment, and certainly the UK, is facing enormous changes to its higher education system, whether it's to do with funding uh, or simply political threats and pressures. Now, Senger, again, goes back a long way, 1990. Peter Senger is worth reading about how you respond to major change. And he came up with three elegant concepts. I haven't got time to go into all detail, but he said we respond in three ways. The first is reactive. If I was parodying it, I would say, that's stopping ordering paper clips. But in other words, it's cutting costs, redundancies, etc. Adaptive is about fundamental restructuring of the institution. And that, and that is going on certainly in higher education institutions in the UK at the moment. Generative is a very interesting approach to change. Generative is saying the real answer to dealing with major change is whatever field you're in, this doesn't apply to higher education, whatever, as it were, imagine it's a game you're playing. You're playing a sport on a particular playing field. And the best way to de describe the generative approach is the winners are those who adapt and change the game, create a new playing field, and win on it, as opposed to continuously trying to win on the existing playing field. And that's very hard, but it comes back to this whole issue of innovation. And what I want to conclude on is really trying to help us to think about our institutions in a different way. I mean, the other day, uh, my director of research, uh, who also teaches on our top management program, said, I think we need to drop a term. Tradition well, when I came into this sector, I was told you must not refer to a university as an organisation. A university is an institution in the right sense of the word. And um, so we had higher education institutions, but we need to change it because of the growth of the, pub of the private sector, private providers, and maybe the way the government's driving university into perhaps almost a kind of bipolar system of, of providers on the one hand and more research-based on the other. She said we should perhaps call it no longer HEIs, but HEPs, higher education providers. Well, I don't think that's enough. I think we, I'm, I'm just going through, I, it's an interesting quote from a book by Sir David Watson, who was Vice Chancellor at Brighton University, uh, was at the Institute of Education, has worked a lot with us. And it's actually linked to the church, but it was drawing the distinction between an organisation and an institution. An organisation exists to get something done and requires management. While an institution, and in a sense this is what universities are, is less concrete, is largely held together by people in the mind. It is, a, it is a sort of set of fantasies, of projections of those associated with it. It is what makes a university so rich. 
But I wonder whether we will be saying they're all institutions in 10 years' time. And I think we're going to have higher education institutions, we're going to have higher education providers who will be much more teaching-led, and we'll have higher education organisations. So I think there are huge opportunities for the sector, but I think we battle against a lot of issues which are about trying to break down boundaries, trying to uh, see new... Um, Try, 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 try to see new models. There's one other thing that gets in the way of change. I, I do credit this to the Harvard Business Review. I do like it. I think it's quite typical. For the meeting, I need a copy of the agenda, the hidden agenda, and my own twisted personal agenda. Now, you've never seen anyone like that, have you? Um, but the truth is that we also run quite political organisations with a small p. So how am I concluding? This has all been about... Strate uh, technology being at the heart of strategy for transforming universities, but it's also been about innovation. And I think we need to work very hard at whatever level we work. This isn't just a talk for vice chancellors or pro vice chancellors, but breaking out of silos, breaking boundaries down, crossing new boundaries, creating new paradigms, new models of what universities or departments or faculties or whatever should be, and encouraging a bit of disruptive innovation. And back to where I started in terms of a cold climate, we do need to encourage some unlearning of attitudes, not just about technology or not recognising the value of technology, but unlearning in terms of the overall approach to how we create innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, colleagues, if you want to put your hands up in the room so we can start to get the uh, mic to you and uh, while we take the first question online. Do you want to come and say it? It's a long one. There was one there. There's a... Yes. No, do you want to come, Can you come here? up here? It's not working. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, would you like to ask your question? Can you take it to her, please? While we get this one working. Uh, Vicky McGarvey from Nottingham Trent University, and thank you. Very interesting and thought provoking presentation. I just wondered with respect to um, the issues between, or the tensions between academic staff and professional services. Uh, with respect to the discussions that have gone under the Times Higher Education yeah. Supplement recently. I think it's the University of Northampton that are making staff redundant there and uh, this um, emphasis on putting uh, resources into the teaching community because that's why students come to universities is because of the teaching, not necessarily because of the administration. I just wondered how you actually deal with those kind of tensions and whether they can be re reconciled? Uh, they often can't be completely reconciled because they're about sharing out a smaller cake, which is why we're going through so much change in the sector over the next few years. I think there are issues. Another phrase I would like to ban is back office. The idea, and it's not just in higher education, it's in local government, central government, you know, i.e. the people who do the HR or the IT or the, you know, they're not really important. And what matters only is what is in the front, in front of the student. Um, now, interestingly, technology occupies a really joined up space there. But I do think that, um, I, I, I think there can be some often some simplistic thinking. I'm not sure the detail of what's happening at Northampton University. But there can be simplistic thinking that says that only what matters is what happens at the interface with the user, customer, client, whatever you want to call it, where the sector is. What the so-called back office does sometimes, if it does it efficiently, is hugely important to the creation say, of the student experience. I mean, we've just created a new network 
um, uh, in fact involving IT, uh, called Leading the Student Experience. And it brings together not just Pro Vice Chancellors of Teaching and Learning, but it brings together USISA, which is the IT uh, community, SCOL, the librarians, AGCAS, the careers people, AMOSHI, the student services people, getting a sense of joined up. Now, some of them will be front of house, some of them are back of house, so to speak. That's irrelevant. It's whether they're doing a job that is serving the student. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to make sure we've got 64 people um, following online here and a few questions coming in. So if I can summarise one or two of them. Um, AJ is actually asking about this challenge of enabling VCs and DVCs to understand how ICT can indeed be a strategic tool. I wonder if you could comment on what the Leaderships Foundation approach is to that challenge. Well, the first chance in working with JISC is to make available a way in which universities, particularly at scene levels, can look at themselves. Um, though that doesn't necessarily motivate senior leaders to action. I don't know what you think, but I think what motivates senior leaders to action is seeing someone in the next place doing something that they should be doing. I wouldn't say it's envy, jealousy, that's all the wrong words, but it's sort of seeing things that really are worth it. And I think the way that you make change happen is creating opportunities for those new ideas to, to surface and to cause that envy or jealousy that says we need to do that as well. And it, it's an interesting comment on the world we're moving into in higher education. Everyone's saying, UK certainly, we're into a more competitive era of higher education where, um, with, with the new legislation and so on. But actually, you've got to be collaborative as well. I worked in the private sector for many years, and people think the private sector is just about competition. I tell you, it isn't. The private sector is very shrewd at collaborate, collaborating as well as competing. And we've got to encourage that collaboration. We've got to encourage universities to see down the road they're doing that. Yeah, we'll either have a do it ourselves or we'll collaborate with them. Oh, that's a very interesting response. I hope AJ is satisfied with that. And uh, hmm, there's a lot of food for thought there. Can I just take one more coming in um, online? Dominic um, is talking about how seductive the business metaphor is for universities and how that often leads to quite inappropriate mm. um, models for governance that are quite alien to us. Well, I think you picked up from my talk, I am not simply promoting a sort of, as you say, seductive, private sectorish, managerialist model. I'm afraid it won't work. Uh, or if it does, it will take the heart out of what a university is about. But that's not a recipe for doing nothing. You've somehow got to take the elements that will work in a university in, uh, and will work in a university setting. Um, it, it, I mean, there, there are some big issues for universities. I think um, one of them I mentioned the silos. It is that I'm not going to use the word being more corporate because that sounds private sectorish. The word I like to use is aligned. Uh, there are a lot of unaligned people in universities. Um, now, I mean, there's an interesting, if you read your Guardian education today, someone who works a lot with us, Professor Sir Peter Scott, who is Vice-Chancellor of Kingston University, is now at the Institute of Education, is talking about the white paper in England and the whole issue of the extent to which the approach is taking away that sense of an open system, whether it be blue skies research, whether it be a more open approach to teaching and much more kind of hypothecated around agendas. Now, somewhere along there, there's a, on that spectrum, is the right place to be now. But I think there is a need to move towards a more aligned space. I mean, even at the top, one, another bit of our research that you can find on our website is about top teams in higher education done by Dr. Tom Kenny, who runs our top management programme, and his stories of how 
of both successful and unsuccessful top teams is very interesting. And the unsuccessful ones has extraordinarily competitive behaviour within the top team or unaligned behaviour. And there is an issue about how far you can allow too much freedom in a world where the competition is going at you. It's a very complicated period, but we're not into seductive, private sector, managerialist solutions, except maybe for those, and there are many private universities in the audience here, there may be some private universities for whom that's the right solution. Uh, anyone from BPP here? I mean, that, they might say that's how we operate. Malcolm is up there. Thank you. Um, I'm sure learning technologists love the aligned word and uh, <laughs> will definitely want to work on that. I'm just going to take a comment from Malcolm Reed. No, it was a bit of a follow-up to uh, uh, Dominic's question on the seduction or otherwise. Do you think, I mean, we shouldn't perhaps put words into Vince Cable, uh, into, into Vince uh, Cable. And why Malcolm. not, Malcolm? But <laughs> do, you think that, do you think that that is exactly what he was referring to in the quote that, um, that he yeah. put up, that it is the kind of mass teaching uh, rather than mass education that he would uh, regard as being an example of, of innovation. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. It's possible. Do you I, want to say a bit more? Well, I, I, I need to say that I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a very detailed point because, you know, he's not a... Well, he's a policy for the private sector background. I think the government does... The government's rhetoric is one which is of a much more corralled sort of a... And, commercialised approach to, to teaching and we do have to make sure we educate our politicians. In fact, I'm going to be at the Vice-Chancellor's Conference this week where Vince Cable is speaking and I'm sure quite a few Vice-Chancellors we wanted to educate him further. Well, we're very relieved to hear that <laughs> indeed. So can you thank you very much for that fascinating talk. Thank you.